Horrocks' observations of the transit of Venus were going to be the key to working out the ultimate question. What was the size of the solar system? It was beginning to dawn on astronomers how they could do it. They already had one piece of the jigsaw. Observations of the planets had meant that astronomers knew exactly how long it took each planet to go round the sun. The further a planet was from the sun, the longer it took to go round. And back in 1619, Kepler told the world in his famous third law of planetary motion that the relationship was a precise one. The third law stated that the distance of each planet from the sun was proportional to the time it took that planet to make one revolution around the sun. So it meant that people knew the relative distance of all the planets from the sun, but not their absolute distances. In a sense, they had an accurate map, but they didn't know the scale. But it was realized that if the next transit of Venus could be used to determine one distance, that of the Earth from the sun, then from that figure the exact size of the whole solar system could be worked out. How was that to be done? Horrocks, sitting in northern England, saw Venus move across the face of the sun. But imagine the point of view of someone else a long way away, say, the other side of the world. From there, Venus would appear to trace a different line across the face of the sun. What you'd have is a giant problem in geometry, with lines stretching through space. Kepler had worked out the relative distances of Venus and the Earth from the sun, and they would know the exact distance between observers on Earth, so they could work out this distance on the face of the Sun. If they knew this, then they could easily work out the actual size of the Sun, and from that, at last, they could calculate the Sun's distance from the Earth. And from that one known figure, Kepler's law meant that they could immediately work out the dimensions of the whole solar system. So much for the theory. The problem remained of making sufficiently accurate observations, especially from the southern hemisphere. And they had to wait a bit as well. The next transit wouldn't be for more than a hundred years after Horrocks saw it. the transit of 1769, Britain decided that nothing less than an all-out effort would do. It was easy enough to make observations from Europe, but much harder from the other largely unexplored southern hemisphere. It was decided that a major naval expedition would take place. The reason was simple. It wasn't just a case of finding the actual size of the solar system. They saw that advances in astronomy would help navigation. The Royal Society certainly saw the importance of the observation, and they applied to George III for money to finance the trip. He awarded them £4,000, which is basically what they'd asked for. For the main expedition to the Southern Hemisphere, they decided to go to Tahiti. It was exactly the other side of the world from Europe, and part of the reason for picking it was that the natives were friendly. That only left the question of who should go. The Navy looked for an officer with some experience of astronomy. They found a relatively obscure but confident seaman who had previously carried out observations of a solar eclipse. He also had the navigational skills to get to Tahiti. And so, out of the need to make an astronomical observation from the Southern Hemisphere, was born one of the most famous seafaring voyages ever made. It was the stuff of legends because the obscure but competent seaman the Navy chose was Captain James Cook. His Majesty's bark, the Endeavour, whereof you are commander, is to be fitted out in a proper manner to observe the passage of the planet Venus over the disk of the Sun on the 3rd of June, 1769.
the crew had to put up with Cook's mad ideas about Nouvelle cuisine, sauerkraut was issued, and they were fed fresh meat and vegetables whenever available. And whatever was issued had to be eaten, captain's orders. But nine months later, in April 1769, they reached Tahiti with not a single case of scurvy. Quite an achievement for those days. There were seven weeks to spare before the transit, and they waited at the site they had chosen, which they called Fort Venus, hoping for good weather. Tough life. This day proved as favourable to our purpose as we could wish. Not a cloud was to be seen the whole day, and the air was perfectly clear, so that we had every advantage we could desire in observing the whole passage of the planet Venus over the sun's disk. The thermometer, exposed to the sun about the middle of the day, rose to a degree of heat we had not before met with. Once they'd seen the transit, Cook proceeded with his other orders to explore the southern ocean for further land. He went on to chart the coasts of New Zealand and Australia. Pretty successful trip, really. 138 people observed the transit all over the world. Their observations were collected together and compared, and then they did their sums. They got a range of figures for the distance to the sun, from 88 to 108 million miles. They took the average. And that meant that the distance of all the planets from the sun could now be worked out. So, one outcome of Cook's epic voyage to the southern hemisphere was the charting of the solar system itself. So they'd managed to work out the distance of the five wandering stars, the planets, and all without ever leaving the Earth. The next transit was in 1874, and for the first time, astronomers could actually photograph it. Venus finally yielded all her secrets in 1964. A radar signal bounced from the Earth gave an exact figure for the distance of Venus from the Earth. And from that, they worked out the modern accepted figure of the distance from the Earth to the Sun, which is 93 million miles, or 149 million kilometers. That's only a few percent different from the figure after Cook's epic voyage. Mm -hmm. 